Welcome to episode number 179 of CXO Talk. I'm Michael Krigsman, and what an interesting show we have today. We're talking about privacy and privacy engineering with one of the most preeminent people on the planet, one of the greatest experts on the planet, to talk about this topic. And that is Michelle Dennity, who is the chief privacy officer at Cisco. And she is also author of one of the definitive books on this topic. Michelle, how are you? I'm doing well. Thanks so much for having me on your show, Michael. Well, it's great to see you again. We were on a panel together in Stockholm, Nary, what, three or four weeks ago? And, yeah. And we had a lot of fun, and I certainly learned a lot, and so I'm excited to hear what you're doing. And so tell us about Cisco, and tell us about privacy, and give us a little bit of background about yourself. Yeah, so... Um Thank you again for having me. I really appreciate this opportunity. Privacy is a relatively new field, and I was actually fortunate enough to be one of the first named chief privacy officers. Um, and, and I come from an intellectual property litigation background, but there's a lot of different um, paths that people take into this profession through the IT field proper, through IT security, through marketing um, HR, anything that has to do with really curating assets about human beings. And so that's where I happen to come through the legal path. But at Cisco, I am actually in a business unit that is a discrete business unit called the um, Security and Trust Office. So we bring together security, privacy, quality, uh, privacy engineering, and security engineering, as well as some basic research in these specific fields. And we build out those tools for our customers as advisors um, to those folks and work with public policy and legal in that capacity. And then we also work on our own future systems and current systems to bring them into um, really centric around data, data assets and, and the human beings that, that use them and, and really leverage them as assets in their business and in their lives. Michelle, privacy is on the surface may seem like uh, this kind of simple thing, you know, we use Facebook, we need to set the settings, but it's actually quite uh, a bit more complex than that. And you talk about privacy engineering, which I think indicates some of the layers of complexity that exist. So maybe can you tell us what is privacy engineering and why is this whole field so fraught with challenge and with difficulty and with complexity? Yeah, so, so it's a great question. I'm so thrilled that you asked it. I think it's privacy engineering is often confused and, and, and kind of equated with privacy by design. Privacy by design is a public policy wherein um, entities that run systems that have information about people um, are tasked with thinking about privacy before they build and deploy, um, having settings that are easy to use for customers, et cetera, you know, great aspirational public policy type aspirations. To build those aspirations, we need what we call privacy engineering. And privacy engineering, I look at not as just a technical uh, field. It really is bringing together people, process, and technology, but leveraging basic infrastructure, traditional engineering concepts, such as business activity diagramming, process flow diagramming, user interface, and, and using even integrating new technologies like artificial intelligence and using analytics to, to build systems that actually um, respect the, the identities and the kind of full form and leverage of the use about people. So in, in a sentence, the way I define privacy in, in functional terms is that it is the authorized processing of personally identifiable information according to fair, legal, moral, and ethical um, principles. Wow. It's a mouthful. Yeah. <laughs> we can so, tear it apart a bit if you want. Yeah, <laughs> actually. I about it with my dad. <laughs> yes, please, please dissect that for us because it's bringing together so many elements. Yeah. So. Um, basically, uh, I'll give you a little bit of the origin of the book. So we, there are three co-authors, Jonathan Fox, Tom Finneran, and myself, and we come from different perspectives. 
Jonathan is, is the operational guru. He came in initially as a pioneer in digital licensing. Um, Tom Finneran, who coincidentally is my, also my father, um, has been in the computer architecture services and security business for the last um, half century. Uh, he probably wouldn't like that. Um, and then I come in from the legal side and as a chief privacy officer. And basically, we came together and said that we're talking a lot in public now, finally, about what does it mean to be a digital citizen? Does it mean that you have to give up all your information to do things like search? Do you have to only have a business that's run on your own personal information, like a social net networking um, platform that's free? Or is it something different? Should there be a different model where we are able to segment, command, and control elements of our identity? And I, and I really think it's the latter um, that, that really creates what I call values to value, which means if we value our integrity, our individualism, the, the special talents that we bring to bear as individual customers, as individual employees, as individual citizens, and then also respect the aggregate. How do we secure, protect, monitor that ecosystem so that we know that people are safe, so that we know that information can be verified? So we take those basic concepts and we say, how do you functionalize that? What does that mean to the engineer? Because public policy is great, but when you go and you talk to people that are building things, they're thinking in terms of zero and one, switching. Where does the traffic go? What does it mean to process information fairly? What does it mean to have proportional access to information? And so the answer to those questions is actually a breakdown of various techniques. So I'll give you a, a, an example that's kind of an easy one. Uh, how many privacy policies have you read recently, Michael? Probably zero you know, I, I, yeah, I, yeah, zero to one. I see them. And, um, you know, I think the feeling is, A, they're too complicated, and what's the point anyways? Exactly. So perfect, perfect reaction. I think that's the reaction of many people. Um, and, and the person who is, is like myself, the governance officer who is in charge of presenting this information to you, we're actually serving many masters. When we write a privacy notice, we're required by law to make it very complicated. And yet those same regulators say, why isn't this simple enough for consumers to use? We also recognize that, that we are a multinational world. I mean, look at what just happened just last night with this vote with Brexit with the United Kingdom leaving the European Union. What a shock for this generation. That's going to be a huge sea change. At the same time, we are heavily internet, interconnected as commercial and cultural entities globally. So when I look at that and I say, I can either say this is too hard and therefore there's no privacy and let's give up the whole thing. Or I can sit back and say, these are policy decisions that have been made. What are policy decisions they're business rules. And how do we create systems? We look at business rules and we look at the, the functionalities, the requirements and the specifications. And then we figure out what is possible to build with technology. What do you create with context, training, more accessible language, um, greater platforms, using more senses, you know, using video rather than flat text, for example. And, and all of that is, is brought to bear. So, the future of the privacy notice, I think, um, we can either say it's going to be a footnote in history, it's going to be the realm of, of lawyers, suits, and regulators, wonks, um, or we can say this is another opportunity to really create a context where we say to you, Michael, that the choice of giving us your information is to give it here, and this is with whom I'm going to share it, this is how it will be used, or this is the choice of either not using the platform or maybe paying more for a platform that doesn't share your information with advertisers so you can still get the kinds of informational services that you want without the trade-off of using your own identity or maybe tracking you or, or reporting your face or other personal aspects um, to run their business. And, it's, and it is a requirement um, to have a sustainable business. So you can't just say make it all so that the citizen gets to choose everything. If I got to choose everything, I would tell the IRS, our taxing agency in the U.S., um, that I didn't make any money last year. But I certainly wouldn't want to tell my bank or my creditors that. Um, so 
there's a choice to be made that is your individual choice. There's another one to be made that is, is your relationship choice. And that is the exquisite opportunity in privacy engineering and, and a really important reason why I'm doing it, where I'm doing it at Cisco right now, because we're all about flow. We're about that network that connects every one of these services, whether it's a brick and mortar shop or it's a wholly informationally driven social network. There's a network underneath that making decisions about where information goes. So we want to build those systems really giving you more tools to control your data, to understand what the collective choices are made for monitoring, surveillance, getting a warrant mm -hmm. if there's a, a, a suspected crime going on. Um, and, and I think all of those are requirements that are the perfect storm for innovation. Right. So given all of these pieces which range that you're looking at, which range from how a business or an individual should respond to privacy or think about privacy online, to building products, to even, you mentioned business process flows, even designing organizations. And then there, of course, is government policy. What is your, what is the kind of, what is the guiding principle or the central thread that links all of these many disparate pieces together? It's such a good, good question. I think, um, at the highest order and the kind of fluffiest answer I can give you, uh, most comprehensive, I should say, rather than fluffy, is it's really about um, respect and ethics. So respect of the individual as a person. So I respect your information as an individual, but also your common respect for the informational economy. And, and then ethics. There's a lot of things that we can do with technology. We can do mass surveillance at a scale we've never even dreamt of. And the question of ethics is, should we? And, and where should we? And how do we respect? Um, and, and again, I'll, I'll rotate on the United Kingdom simply because it's such big news today. How do you respect 51% of a nation that says we want to decide independently of our neighbors, and yet we are absolutely dependent economically and culturally um, with trade and interaction with those same people. Those decisions on, on that level of ethics and morality and respect have to be respected within the network so that when you are American online and dealing with American ethics and our kind of rugged individuality ethic as a nation, you're, you're, you may have different requirements and settings then when you're in France and you have a very different perspective based on what happened during World War II with anonymous tip lines. They are un it's unlawful to have an anonymous tip line in France, which is kind of an interesting thing. So it seems very antithetical to privacy, but that's one of the choices they make. So when you figure out how does that flow go from network to network, you have to have enough complexity so that individuals and individual countries and individual entities like businesses um, have some choice, but at the same time, you have to have enough standardization and common language that people can really interoperate with these platforms and get things done and are able to go back and audit and police those same networks. We are talking with Michelle Dennity, who is the Chief Privacy Officer at Cisco. And you can ask her questions on Twitter using, using the hashtag CXOTalk. And we have a question from Twitter, Michelle, from Arsalan okay. Khan, who's asking about the relationship of technology to uh, put on my glasses. So <laughs> how, too. I know if I don't have my glasses, I can barely see. Uh, so how tech, not, how tech savvy should do privacy officers need to be in order to give functional requirements to engineers? So I think the broader question is this relationship between policy requirements and the, and the engineering part of it, the technical part of it. Okay, so I'm going to sound very narcissistic here for just 10 seconds. But the only reason I busted my butt to write a book is because I needed to answer that question. Um, a big part of success in this field, I believe, and I think really interesting conversations and innovations will pop out when legal people learn to speak tech and tech people learn to understand legal. 
And I'll give you an example. I, I went um, in a prior organization. Um, I went to India and I was working with a developer that was doing very large scale back end enterprise level um, tagging of systems. And it was for, you know, a security purpose. So very virtuous type of a purpose. And yet it, it's one of those things where suddenly instead of handing a, a dumb client or a dumb piece of technology to your customer, suddenly you have all this information coming back and creating big data sets um, so that you can manipulate those data sets to discover anomalies, patterns, and threats. And yet at the same time, you still have that information. So I flew and I was working with the engineering team from the beginning, which is thing number one to answer, directly answer the question, get there as early as you can. Um, when I was discussing what we were expecting from a privacy perspective, six months later after I got home, I felt like I was being very clear. Here are the requirements. Here's proportionality. Here's the nation state issue. Here's recognizing people that, that have to be bumped off the system and the notice that must be given, blah, blah, blah. I get home and about six months later, I get a call from the team and they're so excited. They've built something really cool. They want to show me. And I said, well, show me the aspects of that technology that, that we were talking about when I was in Mumbai. Um, and, and they said, oh, we just thought you were going to write a disclaimer. And I just thought, you know, it's like cool hand loop. What we have here is a failure to communicate. So this was actually a big, you know, we've been talking about doing a book for a long time um, to capture all these really rich discussions that we were having about the overlay of technology and policy and law. Um, and this was really the impetus. So in chapter four of the Privacy Engineers Manifesto, we specifically address how do you convert something like OECD principles and fair access principles and things like FICRA and all these other specific privacy laws, how do you convert that language into the language of engineering, which is requirements, specifications, and when and where do you fit that into either an agile or a waterfall type development process? Um, same discussion when you're doing um, M&A transactions where you're trying to get the value out of a, usually a smaller company, but sometimes same size companies merging together. And what you're looking at as value from an economic perspective is often customer base. If you fail to engineer a process that respects the privacy of the customers that you're buying, you may find that you paid millions and millions for assets that you can't touch because it's against the law. So I think to, to uh, wind to the other end of that question is, how much does a lawyer need to know? My answer is, I, I'm sorry, because the law is complicated itself. As much as you can, you need to get geeky. I was a psychology undergraduate. Uh, I was, you know, then I went to law school. Granted, I love patent law, and I went into it because I love technology that's new and non-obvious. Um, but you really do have to get down and dirty and ask the question so that you know when you're getting shined on by people who want to dismiss you and say, we're just going to look at this as compliance and give you a check mark. And you want to also be able to give your input and say, you know, it's not going to work this way, but how about this? And it's the how about this that really inspires, to me, the Privacy Engineers Manifesto, because it's the new authentication models. It's understanding what, what do all these new um, big data and analytics models have to do to support what we're trying to do um, to lessen the complexity of data management for the individual and the individual business, while also making sure that we have standards that are clear enough and ethical enough to pass scrutiny? So I know I answered probably four different questions, but the short answer is yes. Get to know your technologist, take them out to lunch, figure out their language, um, or and you'll get a lot further. And maybe you'll even get some of their budget, which is key for many privacy professionals. Okay, so we have another question from Twitter. And Wayne Anderson says that today in the world of customer experience, personalization is everything. And so from a privacy standpoint and an ethics standpoint, where do the boundaries lie, the, the appropriate boundaries? Okay, so this is one of my favorite questions because I often hear from uh, particularly, particularly marketing executives when I'm talking to them, they say, we need more, we need more. Well, it's true that you need more information about someone to become more personal. But 
I think the, the best analogy is kind of the first date analogy. If you have gone online, and we all can now, and Googled everything and called up that person's neighbors and called their bosses and followed them around town before the first date, and you start like presenting things based on all of your extensive surveillance of that individual, I will guess that you probably won't get date number two because guess what? Super creepy. The online world isn't all that different. There are times when I simply want to be looking at shoes because I'm trying in the back of my head to work on a really difficult business problem. I don't want you in my face following me around the net with those shoes. I don't want you personalizing and sending me shoes I've already purchased, which drives me nuts. Uh, we're collecting all this information and you're trying to sell me things I've already bought. So personalization is critical and this is why privacy engineering is so profitable as well as necessary from a, a, a a um, compliance perspective. And this is where I'm really focusing at Cisco today. My team in particular is looking at business models that are enhanced by having a grip on the complexity of human information. So when you know that a person is kind of coming down that purchasing funnel or, or entering into a, a sister type of business, so air flight and Rental cars has often been a great analogy from the early days of federated identity discussion. That's the key, is understanding who owns what, who can deliver on what, and when is that perfect moment when the person wants to have all of those information streams joined, and really importantly for your compliance efforts going forward in light of this, the latest European legislation, how do you disjoin sections of that information appropriately so that you don't lose the whole customer when they say, I don't want some sort of a subscription mailing from you. So by really thinking hard about what are the components of a relationship and how do we kind of lift and separate and curate them, then we're going to understand that we actually have much greater asset sets to combine and use later. So from a compliance, so compliance does not lead to greater profitability. But if I'm understanding what you're saying correctly, understanding the bounds of uh, ethics and privacy and what consumers care about, I'm, I'm not meaning to put words in your mouth, what consumers care about means that you can design products that will be desirable to those computers and that uh, consumers and they will trust you and that is what will lead to greater to greater relationship and therefore they'll buy more from you and create profit obviously from that absolutely i mean it, in we talk about actually in the book about facebook i think it's such an interesting example so you know it's it's always the one of the more notorious ones that's always you know in in the crosshairs of everyone in this discussion so, you know, and they have a wonderful team there. So I have no casting aspersions on Facebook. It's a platform that I use and I like. However, when they first started, let's think about what the landscape looked like. MySpace was king until a young girl met someone online who she didn't know and went to go meet him. And it turned out that he was a murderous rapist. Suddenly, bad press everywhere. Who knows who's on MySpace? It's no longer this cool music sharing platform. Now it's a, a dangerous place where you don't know anyone. At that perfect psychological moment, in comes, you know, whether it's the twins or, or Mr. Zuckerberg or whomever, in comes these nice clean cut boys from Harvard. And the only people who can get on the platform are nice clean cut people from Harvard. And then nice clean cut people from the London School of Economics. And then nice clean cut people from Stanford. So it was the ultimate velvet rope, if you will, when they first got started and first started building momentum. And if you think about it, it was not an open internet at all. It was the ultimate in private. You had to be a student who either could learn or buy your way into one of these elite universities to even get on the platform. Very desirable. Their next move after they went out of the EDU stage was to have something that they called circles. So only people in your circle could see the, the page, which was a static page at the time that you would post. 
until one day I looked on my circles and I found that one of my circles was London. I'm a friendly gal. I don't know everyone in London. And so suddenly then you had the whole world and then, you know, Facebook as we know and love it today exists. So the interesting thing to me economically is how did they beat out MySpace? How did they beat out Homestead? How did they meet, beat out at, at home? All these names that many people probably don't even remember that were going on in the Valley. If we, you know, I was living out in, in Silicon Valley at the time when, when Facebook got really started. And at that point, we heard 10 to 20 of these different platforms that sounded exactly the same. So if you're being pitched for Facebook, you heard this story 100 times. It was that, authentic, uh, that authentication piece that really won the day. So I think that's a, it's a really interesting, apocryphal story about how building in at least the marketing around it, and I'm hoping the engineering behind it, if you build in gradual trust, I'm not saying to take that trust away later, I'm saying to build in that trust and really leverage a platform that is private, that is something that people can trust over time, um, I think you really will find something that will build and grow and then people will stick on the platform because it's really not all that different than any other mes messaging platform. So essentially what you're saying is build in trust, build trust into your product, into your platform, and there will be customer loyalty behind that. And privacy and take, can play, and pl and play an important role. Yeah, and I think both privacy and trust are, are absolutely married to each other. They don't exist unless they exist over time. So just as you know, the question about personalization is so important, don't be afraid to take a little time. Don't be afraid to actually build a true human relationship and to respect that with tools. You know, loyalty cards that actually treat their loyalty guests with real deals, um, those things are sticky. The, the things that last, the things that are over time that I can be trusted, is the quality same and consistent over time? I think those are the things that really build it. I think where we get led astray, particularly the privacy discussion, is we have this feeling, particularly that younger people just want to give away everything and they want to say everything. And I, I think also the other thing that's not recognized about the younger generation is they will jump from platform to platform if they don't like what you're doing. They will hide one persona from their parents. They will share a very different one with their girlfriends and share a different one yet again with boyfriends or someone that they've just met and employers. I think that behavior is what we need to build into every one of our systems because that's the right pace. Figuring out how we can be our complex human diverse selves over time is a winning and delightful platform for our users. So I want to talk about uh, government policy and privacy policy, but one point here relative to what you were just saying, which is from a, a practical standpoint, you, you mentioned young people. How should young people and how should the parents of young people be thinking about privacy? And on, on one level, that's kind of a far cry from you know, the next part of the thing that we have to talk about, you know, this, this, you know, government policies and regulations and all of that. But I think it's what people care about. Everybody's nervous about their privacy online and for good reason. Yeah. And I actually think, I think it should be upside down. I think we should be talking first to our families and our kids and our communities about what their expectations are and what their desires are for privacy with both the view of the, I want it now of the younger brain but married to the wisdom of the parents that say, I wanted it now then too, and here's what happened. It's called judgment. <laughs> you know, we are not, um, we're not antiques. We really are useful to our, our kids, whether they acknowledge it or not. But I think actually taking these requirements um, and specifications for what we want as a society first and taking those to the public policy debate rather than having, sitting back and saying, how are we going to control this? How are we going to get in front of this? How are we going to slow this down and stop this? That has been chronically ineffective. If we read our history, we know it doesn't work. So I think, I think those two notions are, are very wedded together. And I think even the least technologically savvy person has a story to talk about with their kids about reputation, about 
how change and change in the things that you share with the types of people you share over time happens. Um, great stories about how you keep a friend, sad stories about how you lose a friend. All of those things are reflected in our online communications as well. And all are really important basic values and principles to build into our discussions at, at the very earliest stages. We're seeing one-year-olds who know how to use um, these smartphones better than their parents do. So it can't be too early to start about talking about your brand, your reputation, your personality. You know, what's your story? What story do you want to tell? What, are, what If people saw you and just read what you put out there, what story would they tell about you? These are the kind of exercises we can talk about before we ever get into the, the cool STEM discussions of what platform, how do we code sling, you know, what is the new profession going to look like in the future that actually curates, regulates, and manages these online digital assets. And I do believe they're assets, and I do believe there will be a digital asset manager will be a title in the future. And I know you care a lot about this topic of children and privacy. You started an organization called the Identity Foundation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the Identity Project was started after um, I was working with a company called All Clear ID at the time as a consultant. And I just got on their platform looking to see how it worked. And just lo and behold, discovered that my own daughter had had her identity stolen two times. Once, 11 years before her birth, I hadn't even met her father, and another time when she was about five. Um, one was used mostly for commercial, um, to, to acquire credit cards and credit, and you know, run up some debts and abandon them. And then the next was to traffic human beings that cross the border into the states and acquire um, utility accounts, also abandoned. So by the time she was eight years old, she had the worst credit score possible, what I call a financial birth defect, because there's no way I could have protected her identity 11 years before she was even born. So I was really surprised, and, and I think the, the comma in the story, I guess, is I had already been a chief privacy officer for probably about 10 years when I made this discovery. I'm very aware. I teach people. I have my settings set to all the stuff. Um, and still, this was yet another topic that I just really hit me by surprise and could have impacted her future in a very material way. Wow, your daughter. So on the topic, again, I want to talk about, I want to talk about things like AI and privacy and, again, government regulation we need to talk about. But just one more point on Facebook. How do we, how do we handle Facebook? What, what is Facebook's responsibility because we are at their mercy from a privacy standpoint. And of course, as you said earlier, you know, they have the standard disclaimer language and their uh, contract essentially that we agree to. But when Facebook becomes part of the fabric of our society, our culture, which it is, at what point where do their responsibilities begin and end? And look at it from a privacy standpoint, from a legal standpoint, from a moral standpoint. How do we, how do we dissect that? Yeah, so, I mean, obviously I, I am not their privacy officer, so I can't speak for them as anything other than a consumer of their services, which I do like. Um, but I, I can speak in generalities about these social network platforms. And, and I think it's, it's a very much a two-way street. I, I hate to fork over too much responsibility to the consumer, but you really do have to understand what you're getting in for. Um, think about how much money you're paying for it. Are you paying any dollars and cents? No. What are you paying with? What are those little ads that you're seeing on the side of well, your you're screen? Tra you're trading time? your privacy. You're trading in data. So sometimes it's private data. Sometimes it's metadata, um, trends. Analysis, I, I will argue that, that most of the valuable advertising dollars go to the non-personalized giant data sets. I think those are much more effective. And I also think that using um, the, the so-called software sciences of psychology and sociology and anthropology, we're going to figure out people's perspectives, their trends, the way they behave a lot faster than watching some teenage girl click on, you know, the blue scarf versus the red scarf. So 
so so I'll, I'll say that. I think the trend is going to be more and more big data married to uh, big mm-hmm. research rather than spying on, on discrete activity. So I think I think that is a trend that's that's actually a protective trend for customers and consumers. I think they leveraging and using the tools that they do have to curate your identity is important. I think this is again where that that conversation, and this is I guess more process, people in process of you know before you get on the platform, think about what you're using that platform for. Are you using it for photo sharing with grandparents? or connectivity with, with friends far away? Um, if so, how personal, um, and it's bad lexicography because privacy is so married to feelings and really where I, where I do it, I do it in a very industrial sense of curating an asset um, that is you know, like a critical uh, human asset. Um, but if you think about what you're doing online, I, I, I say a lot online, I experiment on these social networks extensively because of what I do for a living and my personal and professional interests. Um, but not everyone does. And I think as long as you understand what, what it is and what it does um, and how many people can see what you're doing, can judge what you're doing on a very flat sense, they don't know me in person, but they can make a lot of judgments. Um, and then understanding the basic safety for your kids. I see kids posting things online like mom and dad aren't home. Yo, yo, I'm partying. And there's an address in the back. Um, I'm not, I'm home alone. So there's a lot of things to consider before you get into the platform and use it as a tool. So that's thing number one. On the, on the other side, which is what is the organization, the private and the public organization's responsibility? This is where I'm really excited about the work we're doing um, with the IEEE on ethics. I think there is law. And I think that all of these organizations, these, these kind of large organizations in particular, they work very hard. They have great teams. I know many of the Facebook team. I know many of the LinkedIn team. These guys work really hard and they're very sophisticated and they're attempting to comply with over 200 countries, various laws or regulations. But compliance is one thing and human behavior and human desire is another. So I think that they are trying to really focusing more on ethics and, and instead of a do no harm or don't be evil kind of mantra, this is where I'm excited about really digging in with the, the IEEE um, teams and saying, is there a framework like the privacy engineering framework? Can we use business activity diagrams and create business rules for ethics? What is your decisioning structure? And I think that is a really critical Um, responsibility for all of us who have fiduciary operational control over data. And you're referring to the, there's a, an initiative by the IEEE, which I'm sure most people are aware of as a standards body, that you and I are both involved with regarding the ethics and policy making issues in relation to privacy with respect to artificial intelligence and autonomous systems. So yeah. why, why, is th- why is this so, so important? And actually, why don't we talk about AI and autonomous systems? Why, why does privacy become so thorny in that domain? Well, I think, I, I think it's, okay, let's, I'm gonna back up. I'm gonna say why it's so thorny first. I think, let's, let's talk about artificial intelligence first. I think, um, there are Asimov's rules of robotics to think about, you know, robots should do no harm kind of things. And then, you know, you think about the robots that ignore the human commands because they're trying to do, they're trying to make judgments on our behalf and that kind of science fiction-y artificial intelligence. So there's artificial intelligence in terms of um, simulated human artificial intelligence. Um, can we have machines that basically can have judgment and then there's artificial intelligence of the kind of um, what is creepy buying behavior, what is creepy monitoring behavior, what does um, an anomalous um, interaction start to look like when there's a suicidal child on a, on a public platform making statements. Um, there, are, there are a world of different applications. There's even artificial intelligence just to say, how quickly do we fail over back-end systems to keep um, critical infrastructure systems running, you know, keep the power on, keep the food supply safe 
and, and keep any sort of negative false information out of that system. So I think the applications for artificial intelligence are as wide as the imagination. It's not just robots that will come and walk and talk and, and commit heinous acts. Um, so that's thing number one of, like, what is this? Um, the reason I think this is so thorny is we don't have a universal set of laws even around what should be done with automated decision making, with analytics, with the data set quality. You know, when is a data set large enough that you can rely on its quality? And, and if so, are you really pushing down quality to the standard curve, you know, who's under the main curve, where some applications like specialized cancer and personalized medicine, you're really talking about the stigma out here on the tail. So you may only have two, two subjects. And so there's a really interesting traditional statistical reliability discussion that is ethics. There's the legal discussion of ethics. There's a cultural discussion of ethics. Think about how different certain groups in the Middle East ethics are compared to those in Canada, compared to those in China, compared to those in other places in the world. So when you have that kind of level of really innate and bedrock diversity, are there enough common um, threads where we can come up with a framework for at least decision making, if not as much commonality that will be accepted to as many people as possible when you're using these advanced technologies that are largely invisible to the common user? So we're almost out of time, but one of the key things that you're saying is that the laws are not keeping pace with the development of technology. They never will. They never will, and God bless them. You know, if, if the lawmakers could keep up with us, then they should be here building stuff. <laughs> you know, <laughs> we, we want them doing what they do, and we're going to do what we do. Um, but I don't think we'll ever catch up. I think, but it is, it's another thing. And I think this is a trend that's probably only less than 20 years old is, you know, technologists and even very, very small companies need to understand that they have to get involved in that public policy debate. Now we've already asked the lawyers to become partial engineers. We've asked the engineers to understand law and now policy. Um, but I think when we really look at this as a series of requirements and specs for what we're going to build, then you understand where, you, where your dance card is. You don't have to figure out gun control. You just have to figure out this one piece of this one thing that you know something about that the guys in D.C. and Brussels and Beijing may not. And you have to figure out a way to share that information so that we're not making dumb decisions in our legislation. Because it kind of has to be a one-size-fits-many model. And, and it's... Um, I would have, when I started out in privacy, I would have told you that by 2016, we would have a harmonized treaty for data flows, much like we have for shipping lanes and airlines and space travel. And we don't. We're balkanizing. And I think what we've seen in Europe just in the last 24 hours, or Europe and the UK, I should say now, um, where we are separating ourselves more than we are unifying. And so the complexity in this issue is not going to go away. And the good news is where there's complexity, we need an innovation and innovators and creativity and even artists to tell us what it is that we're dreaming of and what are the impacts of those dreams. Okay, and I have just one last question for you because unfortunately the time has just flown by. <laughs> so, so we have a lot of uh, chief information officers that are in our audience and constituency. And what advice do you have for CIOs on dealing with these, these privacy issues and all of the complexity that you've been describing? So one of the most concrete things that you can do, if you don't have a privacy officer sitting on your staff already, find them in legal, find them in public policy, find them as your, in your chief, chief trust office if you have one, and I do, I think you should get one. I think it's working really well for us. Um, get them on your staff. Talk to them early about what your objectives are, even if you don't think it has anything to do with privacy per se, because metadata 
and all of the things that they are running for efficiency so that they can have systems that run well, systems that are efficient, things that, that are cost efficient, many of these decisions are going to be information centric. That's my kids arguing in the background, by the way. I'll go beat them later. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, we have been talking with Michelle Dennity, who is with her family in a hotel room at <laughs> Disney World. And so, Michelle, thank you so much for being here today. Oh, thank you so much for having me. It's such an important and exciting topic, and I, I really appreciate your time. And, uh, and thank your kids as well, because they've been really good. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, guys. <laughs> Everybody, thanks again for watching episode number 179 of CXO Talk. Next Friday, there won't be a show because it's the run-up to the July 4th holiday here in the U.S., and we'll be back the week after. Have a great weekend, everybody, and we will see you soon.